Welcome to the University of California San Francisco Sports Medicine Podcast featuring Dr. Nira Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne discussing hot topics in sports medicine and society. Welcome everyone to our UCSF Sports Medicine Podcast, six to eight weeks with myself, Dr. Nira Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne. Today it'll be just myself and Brian talking about a general approach to knee injuries and some of the treatments that are out there. Um, we sent some questions out on Twitter to hear what people wanted to um, ask questions about, and uh, we've selected some questions. We'll be covering some general information about uh, knee injuries. So. Maybe first question to start out with, Brian. I, I mean, I think everyone's always concerned about what's cutting edge. What's the new thing that's out there? Um, you know, if someone comes into your clinic and asks you, well, what's the best way we can help prevent um, knee pain and knee injuries with what's out there in science? What do you usually tell them? Yes, I think that's a good question. So first of all, we should uh, just let everyone know that we are not totally ignoring Drew, but he is heading off on vacation today. So he's got some cases to do, and then he is, uh, will be back next week. Um, Drew, we're not ignoring you. Um, I think one of the hard things that, to describe what cutting edge is, is people want something really new and exciting. But the reality is, is we come out with really good studies probably every week to every month. And these are published consistently in high level journals. So I think one of the things that comes up is, you know, is there evidence for some of the physical therapy program? So rather than going back to the knee jerk reaction of, can I get stem cell treatments, which we should probably talk about as well, or what can you inject in my knee to make my problem go away? Is there good evidence that some of the stuff that physical therapists do um, actually work? And I think that comes into play a lot in one of the most common things that we see, which is patellofemoral pain. So Nirav, when you have a patient with patellofemoral pain, how do you describe it to them? What do you describe as what's wrong for the most part? Yeah, I think that's a great question because, you know, as we get, you know, patients who are more and more informed. Formed, one of the things we see is they'll look up patellofemoral pain and they'll come in with a diagnosis. It's a cartilage injury. It's it's uh, my patella is not tracking. And what I like to call it is simply just irritation um, behind your kneecap. And that can be multiple different reasons. It can be because they're exercising too much. They're not strong enough in their core. Their patella is not tracking. But I you know basically say it's something that's causing your kneecap to get irritated. And generally, what people will describe is that they're, they have this kind of dull, achy pain that they can't really pinpoint with one finger. Um, it's harder going up and down stairs. It almost gives them like sand paper-like feeling behind their kneecap. So it's one of the most common things that I, that I see in my clinic, obviously with the younger population, but I think it's a common thing that you probably see as well too, Brian, in your clinic. Um, and I think the most important thing, I think the first thing uh, to let them know is number one, to figure out what's causing it. As I mentioned, there are multiple different things. And once you figure out what the underlying issue is, then most of the time it's, it's physical therapy. Very rarely will someone have something that's surgical, particularly with patellofemoral pain, but it's usually physical therapy, figuring out what mechanical issues are there, uh, and then having them change the activity. A lot of people will have mechanical issues and be doing tons of activity. Uh, which is usually the problem. Um, so that's typically what I, I would recommend. Always try that physical therapy first. How about you, Brian, with your, your little bit older population? Yeah, I totally agree. I think that one thing that really worries people is that sandpaper feeling, that feeling like something's grinding and patients have this visualization. Um, and frankly, after I've had surgeries, I've had the same visualization that your cartilage is being scraped away with each movement. And the reality is that that's not what it is. And most likely it's your fat pad, which sits below your, pate your patella. And that gets a little bit inflamed and that gives you the sensation of grinding, but it's not like you've got your patella on a mandolin and you're just cutting off cartilage each time. Um, what I really emphasize to patients with patellofemoral pain are two things. One, it's okay to exercise through it but you've got to change your exercise pattern. There's something about how you were exercising beforehand that caused this imbalance in muscle strength. And it's not necessarily that your muscles are weak, it's that the balance of muscles between the front of your body, the back of your body and your core aren't in balance. So instead of it being a structural problem, like when you have an ACL tear or meniscus tear, this is more of a kinematic problem and how you move and how your muscles are responding. Um, in terms of evidence, I think physical therapists actually do a really good job of doing um, nice studies. And there was a study that came out in the Journal um, of Athletic Training in 2018. And this followed up on something that was called the GATE trial that was sponsored by the NIH in the mid, like I think 2010 to 2013. And what they looked at was knee exercises or core exercises for patellofemoral pain. And they found that in general, patients did better when they were given core exercises for their patellofemoral pain. So this study went a little bit further and they said, well, are there subpopulations 
that can get better with um, strengthening knee, strengthening around the knee versus strengthening around the core. So what they did is basically group, group the patients into two groups. One, kind of the, you're in good shape, you're more athletic, your muscles are relatively well balanced. And the other group was people who are a little bit more out of shape, a um, little bit less, I would say, more exercise naive. Um, and this simplifies the study a little bit, but what they found was that the people who were already in pretty good shape, so these are the people who are running, maybe tried to increase their activity level and then develop patellofemoral pain, did better with a core exercise program. And that kind of makes sense. Um, you're, you probably, especially if you're doing more endurance ac activities, you end up with a little bit of core weakness because your body's trying to conserve energy and put them towards your legs. Those patients did really well with a core activity, about 80% got better. Conversely, people who are a little bit more out of shape, the people that had pain kind of just in that group of, I hurt when I walk downstairs, everything in the front of my knee is achy. They did better by starting with a knee program. So specifically strengthening the quads and hamstrings. So I think this is a great example of where there is cutting edge medicine coming out all the time, but it isn't always something fancy like an injection or taking stem cells from amniotic fluid or chorionic fluid or something somewhat crazy, the really good evidence sometimes are answering straightforward questions in a well-designed manner to give us the ability to guide our physical therapy or guide our rehabilitation after surgery. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people will come in and they'll say, well, I'm really strong. You know, I, physical therapy is not going to work. And honestly, what they've been doing is what we used to do, you know, 15, 20 years ago, which is quad, 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 quad. And they have these great quads, but they're not really balancing it. And the way I like to tell patients is that, you need everything to be balanced. And it doesn't matter how strong your quad is. If your core, it's helping you in terms of taking pressure off your knee when you're landed doing those things. So I think it's really emphasizing to people that really this, this you know treatment that'll take a period of time to work is really key as opposed to the quick fix. Um, and I agree that you know, a lot of people want the quick fix and really to give you longitudinal pain relief, it's about working on those muscles and, and modifying your activity for that short period of time. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, you know, patients may ask, well, how do I, how do I know if an exercise I see on the internet is good? I mean, are there certain things that you tell patients? What are some good sources? You know, is it WebMD? Is it, you know, men's health? Like, what, what, do, you, what do you usually tell Brian? <laughs> um, I think Maxim is out now. I think that probably went defunct when I was in college. Um, I think it's tough. I think that the internet is a mixed bag of information. I think there's great information. Um, I just, I was looking up questions for this today and Leon Scott, who's a, um, a physician in, at Vanderbilt has this really good six minute video on how, what is a patient reported outcome and how does that define how much better you get? But those are the exception, not the norm. So most of the things out there um, really are kind of anecdotal evidence or I like doing these exercises. Um, very few of them have been developed um, that show like an improvement of X number of points over this um, over this um, amount of time. And these are good um, things to avoid while doing these exercises. So I really do think that even though there's a lot of information on the internet, getting your first bout of information from a physical therapist or a strength and conditioning coach that actually has certification, not somebody just at the gym who happens to be doing it, is probably your best first bet. And then transition into doing some of the online videos and things like that. In terms of things that I think aren't safe, I think um, a lot of the things that you see at the gym just in general are totally safe, but it's that combination of doing the exercises and then getting to the point of fatigue and losing form that tends to increase that risk of injury or that overuse pattern. Um, I think the other thing that comes up is we probably all fell into different routines during the pandemic. And as we've come out of the pandemic, getting back into that varied exercise pattern. And a part of the reason why we get these imbalances is if I run three miles every single day, those muscles are getting stronger, the other muscles aren't. So getting back to that balanced exercise program where you're building different parts on different exercise days is probably more, more important than we give it credit for. Uh, speaking of, of evidence-based medicine, Andres asked, you know, stem cells and knee pain. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, feel that, you know, you see on the internet, um, people promoting stem cells as a cure for kind of any kind of joint pain. What's your take on, you know, kind of stem cells for kind of generalized knee pain, particularly for, for the weekend warrior population, Brian? 
Yeah, I think stem cells have, you know, it, it comes up often as a new technology. And I think the reality is, first of all, it's not a new technology, one. Two, it's not approved by the FDA. And I think people understand more and more about the FDA over the last year. But the FDA has approved stem cell treatments for essentially very few things. One is bone marrow transplants, meaning you've had a um, bone marrow cancer. So whether it's leukemia, lymphoma, they irradiate and get rid of your entire bone marrow and then give you a stem cell transplant. And the second is specific cartilage injury. So when you have an isolated cartilage injury in the knee, um, we can transplant your own stem cells, which have been grown up in a lab and then re-implanted on a scaffold. Neither of those technologies are new. Um, I think we get excited about the idea of these new technologies, but the reality is, is cartilage transplant has been around since the mid 1990s. So I was in college already. Um, Nirav, I think you were just born around then. Um, and stem cell transplants for, um, for cancer have been around for a long time as well. So stem cells by themselves have, are not exciting and brand new. What's exciting and brand new is that we understand more about them and we understand that they have differentiation capabilities, especially when they're taken from the bone marrow or taken from fat and put into other body parts to kind of regenerate musculoskeletal conditions. The reality is that it doesn't quite work. So first of all, the idea that stem cells are injected into the knee, look around and say, yeah, I'm gonna make some cartilage right now, doesn't happen. So they don't provide scaffolding. They don't land on the bone and differentiate into cartilage. They don't regrow structures at this point in time. This is the same for ACL, meniscus, cartilage. It doesn't work like that. The best possible benefit we can probably get from them, at least our current level of thinking is, you know, maybe they come in, secrete growth factors um, in, their, in the process of essentially dying, release what's inside them and stimulate kind of this anti-inflammatory pro-growth um, healing for a short period of time. The reality is, is that very few studies have shown a benefit from doing, for doing this over an extended period of time. And no studies have shown any real cartilage regeneration in patients with generalized knee pain. I think the other thing that was really interesting um, is what's actually in the products that you're getting. So there's a really nice study that was um, done and published this year in uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine. And they looked at the actual products inside one of these compounds where they were doing amniotic fluid injections. And the idea was that they're supposed to be these amniotic stem cells. So stem cells from essentially babies. So they have the ability to differentiate into everything. And you could get this injected into a body part and regenerate tissue. The problem was there were no stem cells. So people are paying a lot of money that in this product, there was nothing in there. So there was nothing to actually differentiate into a considerable amount of tissue to regenerate anything. And I think that's one of the things that it's really disappointing in that because this is a gray area that's not well regulated, there's a lot of things that even though the physician or surgeon might have the best intentions, the data and the evidence isn't really there to support it, but patients want that quick fix. They want something that's just, hey, I got injected and get better. And I think that's the other nuance in some of these studies that show there may be a benefit. If you're enrolled in a study looking at stem cell therapies, you're probably gonna be a little bit better about doing the physical therapy afterwards or enrolling in this, this trial where somebody says, hey, I got injected into the knee. If I do my physical therapy, that'll make the stem cells even better. So it gives this unconscious bias to some of these studies. So for these minimal effects gains that we see in some of the studies, especially when they're not well controlled, that might be why you see a little bit of an effect. But bottom line, they're expensive. Some of them are dangerous and they're probably not worth your money. So I think probably, you know, the best thing for us is to, you know, work on prevention. Because I think if you've come into the clinic and you've already have your, your knee pain or your pathology, then things kind of progress down the wrong way. And, and Uzi and Alpha Bravo, uh, you know, two of our followers kind of ask a similar question. You know, how do you prevent, you know, what's the best way to prevent injuries? And, and when I have a patient come into clinic, I think it's, you know, they may ask, you know, well, you know, I'm here for my ankle or, you know, how can I generally, you know, prevent knee injuries? I think number one in my younger population is make sure you're not doing um, too much of one singular activity. So I think number one is to do a variety of activities. So that means play basketball, swim, 
uh, you know, go out biking. So I think that's number one. And number two, I think is, is looking at your mechanics. And, and I think for a lot of people that can be hard to do without a professional, but if you have access, particularly if you're younger to an athletic trainer or strength and conditioning coach, or even now as patients, you can make an, a, an appointment with a physical therapist without a referral from a physician and just have them look at you run, you know, have them look at you jump. And usually most people who have some degree of training can identify, you know, oh, there's weakness in core or your hamstrings are too tight or, you know, your ankles are dropping in. So I think it's identifying those things. And particularly in my population, population that's younger, you can get away with those things. But then suddenly when you transition into being an adult, if you have these movement patterns, you know, that's when the joint pain is going to creep on. So I think it's, you know, about uh, looking at how you do things, not necessarily your strength. Um, and then, you know, kind of then working on that and making it part of your regular workout routine. I think if you're just rehabbing all the time, it can be difficult, but making that part of what you do in terms of exercise is what I, what I tell patients. How about, how about you, Brian? What do you, what do you tell them? Well, actually, I have a question for you. So, yeah. you know, we know that there are ACL prevention programs out there. How much do you enforce that with the kids that haven't had an ACL injury yet? So if you see a 15 year old with anterior knee pain or patellofemoral pain, do you inform them about like the FIFA 11, which is an ACL prevention program, and how effective it is? Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, those prevention programs that come in, I do have a lot of soccer players come and say, how can we make sure I'm not like my teammate who tore their ACL? And those ACL prevention programs, some of the studies say they're 75 to 80% effective in, in preventing non-contact ACL injuries. Um, and also what we know is that if particularly in females, is that if they have anterior knee pain, um, they're also at risk for subsequently getting a ligament injury because what causes anterior knee pain in these young athletes are the same kind of mechanical issues that will lead to an ACL tear. So I think it's a spectrum. If I get a younger person who's 11, 12, or 13 in, and they're having anterior knee pain, I do worry about them not correcting their mechanics than being that 14, 15, or 16 year old that gets an ACL tear. So absolutely, I think part of it is almost in the after visit summary when we're giving patients information to do afterwards, we say, hey, here, there's an ACL prevention program. It's gonna decrease your risk of having an ACL tear. It's gonna hopefully help your anterior knee pain as well too. And most importantly, I think for these kids um, and also parents, it's going to make you a better athlete. These are the same exercises we see, you know, professional teams doing on the side to get them better and more explosive. So I think it's helps pain, prevents injuries and makes you a better athlete. Yeah, I think that's totally true. And I try to get as many of the kids um, as possible at my clinic to do a program or any program like that. And honestly, I think back when the FIFA 11 program started, there weren't that many core exercises. I mean, they were all available. You could always do a plank, but not that many people knew what they were. And now that they're kind of more in the everyday lexicon of exercises, I think it's easier to convince kids to do it. It's that doing it consistently and doing it throughout the season. I think that's another good point about that prevention of injuries is that varied exercise program. And we know that from kids on up doing different things is preventative of injuries. It's preventative of um, burning out. So the idea that if you're gonna have five days a week of exercise, you don't do five days of the same thing. And I think that's probably the most important thing as people get into their thirties and forties is maintaining that varied exercise program and maintaining rest days, or at least days where you're doing something totally different than what your normal exercise pattern is. Um, what do you tell people about nutrition? Yeah, that's always, that's a question I get more and more, particularly from like the endurance athletes that I see, they're, they're very big on nutrition. I think the number one thing is to have a balanced diet. I think that's the most important thing. I mean, there are various different diets. And I think obviously my younger population, I say, look, just eat healthy, eat three meals a day, even basic things like have breakfast, you know, and breakfast shouldn't be going to Starbucks and getting a, a large frappuccino or something like that. I mean, having a balanced meal. Um, and then I think in general, some of the bigger concepts, like avoiding a lot of sugar um, and making sure you're getting a lot of protein, you know, so I think those are the basic tenants. I mean, some people will ask about, you know, what should I do in terms of being, you know, vegan, vegans, anti-inflammatory, or should I have the Gabe Kapler or just all meat all the time diet? Um, and I say anything in, in yes. everything in moderation. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I once used to look like him and then I went vegan, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to, um, have a balanced diet. And, and I think anyone who's trying to achieve athletic gain by using a particular diet, there's so much more bang 
for your buck by just making sure you're looking at mechanics, um, doing multiple sports, you know, doing those things that we talked about as opposed to sitting there and eating one particular thing. I think a lot of people who have success with these quote unquote diets are actually the ones who are also doing the seven, eight other things that we talked about as opposed to the diet suddenly transforming you. So with my younger population, eat balance, eat three meals a day and avoid kind of extremes. Um, but how about for the, for the adults, the older population? Yeah, I, I think nutrition is an entirely different topic and um, it's something we should definitely talk about because I think that this is where the internet really can hose people. So I think the most common thing is you see, you know, person X, let's, we'll call them Chris. Chris talks about his workout plan. It, he does a 10 minute high intensity workout and he looks like he plays in the NBA. He's chiseled, he's got great pecs, he's got a nice tattoo. And you're like, God, if I just do 10 minutes a day, I'm going to look like that. Now, the reality is, is that they're eating a perfect diet. Um, they're taking care of themselves. In addition to that 10 minute exercise video, he exercised three hours that day. So these are people that are professionally exercising and maintaining their bodies through a very rigorous method. For the vast majority of us, that's not necessary at all. But what we can learn from that is eating healthy and really trying to eliminate the processed foods and trying to eat things that are not um, essentially store bought and canned and packaged. So what I tell my patients is trying to avoid anti-inflammatory type things in a general um, diet, such as regular meat, um, vary it and add in chicken and fish, vegetables, um, more vegetables than fruit. Also, who likes fruit? Fruit is variable. If I get a carrot, it's always a carrot. Who knows what you're getting inside that banana? So eat more vegetables and really try to stay away from the processed foods. There's really good literature and I, that shows that the more inflammation we have in our bodies, the more things hurt, which kind of makes sense. What's unfortunate is fat stores our inflammatory um, mediator. So uh, even a little bit of obesity makes a di big difference both mechanically and how we feel and also in the amount of inflammation that's floating around our body. So the, the optimist way to look at it is a little bit of weight loss when you're in your 40s and 50s will make your knees and hips feel a lot better and probably much better than doing any pill or any fad diet, just losing a little bit through proper diet and exercise. Yeah. And I think the other thing you touched on as well too is recovery. I think with with those, you know, that that picture of the guy who's, you know, really, really built or, or girl, or excuse me, female who's really built, is the amount of recovery. So, you know, a lot of people will try to train, they'll do the two to three hours of training and then they'll work all day. I mean, a lot of, if you look at elite level athletes or even athletes who, you know, are very muscular, they'll do an intense workout and then take a two hour nap or then, you know, get a lot of recovery that way. So I think it's also important to understand that it's not necessarily just what you're doing, but it's then allowing your body to recover from that intense intensity of activity that allows them to make their gains. Cause if you just work out all the time, in that high intensity fashion and other recovery days, then you're gonna get that injury as well too. So I think it's about balance in terms of everything and making sure that you're taking time off as, as well too. Yeah, for sure. So in looking at time and the fact that one of us has to do clinic and one of us has to operate, I think we should probably end it for that, but we appreciate everybody sending in the uh, questions. I think it ended up being a pretty interesting podcast and definitely made me, reminded me not to have a large Frappuccino every morning um, before clinic. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening.